streaming done so now okay very good Shija, MU is co-host now, so we can start the session it, uh, at 2.30. Yeah, yeah. Four minutes left. Okay, ma'am. We'll but start at exact 2.30. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Good afternoon, Dr. Shrija. I am audible, right? Yes, yes.
so good afternoon everyone so now it is exactly 2:30 i request dr sada to start the session hello everyone a very good afternoon to all of you i dr shadab khan on behalf of geography department aditi mahavidyalay welcome you all for this 3 days online training program on man made disaster and women as responders since independence today we are at third day of our program the theme of today's program is women's role and disaster risk reduction we have four speakers today we have dr shrija mu from kerala professor rahul sharma from gtb hospital delhi miss mr harshit and miss fatima binte amin from nidm so without any delay i request my colleague dr nitu malik to please start the session over to nitu ji thank you so very much dr shada uh, dear audience today being the third and the very last day of this three day training program i would now begin and proceed uh, with the session ahead and for that without any further ado may i now welcome and invite dr shreja who has been working as hazard analyst with kerala state disaster management authority since 2018 while formally introducing her let me also mention that she has worked in disaster management unit government of maharashtra from 2016 to 2018 she has done her msc in disaster management from tata institute of social sciences mumbai she has also volunteered during a nepal earthquake in the year 2015 um, now after this formal introduction i would now invite dr srija for her insight on the topic human induced disasters and the role of women in disaster management professionals over to you dr srija thank you neetu uh, let me share my screen uh can you see my screen yes sir yeah, please yeah okay thank you so this is a topic in which i am um, going to discuss with you about that is the role of women as disaster management professionals we all know at least in the last two days um, everyone was discussing about uh, how women um, are affected by um, disasters uh, we always consider women as victims or um, are more vulnerable for disasters and it's true it's completely true uh, due to various reasons uh, like the uh, like uh, the reasons are our society being a patriarchal society the women doesn't know the basic skills like um, swimming Uh, or even the fish fish uh, fishing community women are uh, they doesn't know how to swim uh, to various other factors there are many factors which uh, affect that they don't have um, uh, capa- purchasing capacity uh, they don't have proper uh, work they don't work outside um, they don't have they are not handling many different reasons that they have why women are more vulnerable uh, for disasters uh, but that is not always the case there are uh, women who contribute to disaster management um, sector as professionals uh, so i would like to discuss about that and it's uh, it's uh, a relatively a new thing um, that is i'm going to talk about women as disaster management professionals that is the first time i got this opportunity and i got this opportunity to read a lot about this so thank you for that opportunity also Uh, so i am dr srita i am working as hazard analyst in uh, with kerala state disaster management authority so what is the relevance of uh, so what is the relevance of women as responders uh, if you are working with disaster in disaster management sector um, you might be knowing about Asian Ministerial Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, which happened in 2016, I think, uh, 2017. Sorry, 2017, I think, in which um, the our Honorable Prime Minister 
uh, talked about a 10 point agenda for disaster risk reduction, which is um, a guidelines in ancient countries for disaster management, disaster risk reduction, basically. So the third point in um, that was a women's leadership and great involvement should be to central um, should be central to disaster risk management. He said that yes, women are vulnerable. We were talk we are talking about women's vulnerability, but now it's time for women to move to leadership role, take up leadership role for disaster, not only in disaster risk reduction, but also in disaster management, disaster response. In that, he majorly talked about these four points in the note. That is the first being the need for women as um, volunteers. Um, it's not that just women self-help group are sufficient, but rather women uh, engineers, women volunteers, masons, and all should work um, in post-disaster reconstruction rehabilitation. Second is is uh, uh, not uh, second point and it's not is uh, um, is to promote women self-help group uh, which can assist in livelihood recovery. We have seen it in Latur earthquake, Buj earthquake, uh, in, after Odisha cyclone, we have seen this exam, multiple examples many times. Need to include women in NDRF and SDRF. Uh, you know what is NDRF? Uh, National Disaster Response Force. There are 12 battalions all over the country. In that, um, women should be, uh, till now, it is basically men who are working in NDRF and SDRF at state level. But uh, this uh, Prime Minister's 10-point uh, agenda <laughs> mentioned about women to be involved in um, this response uh, as response force. Then last one is to train women elected representative. Um, we all know that local self-government uh, has a huge role in development. And usually, um, development and disasters go hand in hand, we all know. So, to train the women representatives so that they can contribute for sustainable development. So that was one focus which our Honorable Prime Minister said in ANCBRR. And next is the involvement, how the women are involved in um, the disaster management um, process. You all know that Disaster uh, Management Disaster um, Act, Disaster Management Act 2005, is mentioned about uh, three different levels of disaster management authorities, in which the basic level is the District Disaster Management Authority, in which um, the uh, the district collector or district magistrate is a uh, chairperson of District Disaster Management Authority. And right now in Kerala, because I'm since I'm working in Kerala, I'm more aware about the state. That is why I'm mentioning about it. I am sure that is a situation in um, lots of places in uh, India. So right now there are 14 districts in Kerala, out of which 10 districts are headed by um, female district um, collector or district magistrate. Uh, so that is a greater involvement. They are managing the disasters in the ground. They are the, if you know what is an incident command system, you must be knowing that um, there is an incident uh, responsible person, a responsible officer. Right now, these district collectors in 10 districts in Kerala are um, headed by uh, uh, women district uh, or a uh, female district director. Uh, similarly, the political head um, and uh, the policy makers, involvement of women should be there more in that so that um, the, um, the policies uh, made related to disaster management will be more women friendly or um, will be more sensible in that, in that aspect. Similarly, the involvement of women are there in uh, other fields like academy. Because disaster management is comparatively a new field, we all know. So there are more requirement of academicians, researchers. Um, in the first session, uh, Ms. Janki Antaria, she was uh, taking the session and she is my um, professor. And such academicians um, are also involved in um, disaster management. And definitely we all know the role of uh, civil society organizations in which most of the civil society organizations associate with women and they are led by lots of um, civil society organizations are led by women. When we think about disaster re relief, we always think about the NDRF team wearing that orange uniform who will be working in the field doing rescue activities, but that is not um, the only thing related to disaster response, but there are other things. The, these rescue workers can only save these people and bring them, but 
then there is this um, health uh, needs uh, which has to be addressed. Uh, that is um, the female, uh, the, um, you know, there is a medical field in which the doctors, nurses are all, uh, we should work together um, for disaster response in which uh, most of the places, the nurses and the ASHA workers, they are all um, females. Uh, and there are other government systems in which the uh, National Institute of Disaster Management, which has women um, leading the role, um, the state executive committees um, in which women are having the role, uh, as disaster management profession professionals like myself, uh, there are various sectors in which women are re leading the role. I'm not seeing a single person's name because Mm, it's not the contribution of that one person. It is, um, it is something which um, the women um, as a whole should be um, should be able to celebrate. That's why I'm not saying a single person's name. There are NGOs, especially the uh, NGOs which are led by women. We all know about this uh, SSP, which is a very famous NGO which was working in Lathur uh, after Lathur earthquake. They have immense experience in disaster reconstruction that after Latur earthquake in 1993, when the Bujo earthquake happened in 2001, these, uh, these women, they went from Latur to Buj to teach the people in Buj how to um, do uh, disaster reconstruction uh, after earthquake. So they were so skilled people um, who were working. Similarly, about the Chekut which I will mention later. That's also um, something, some initiative uh, at um, Kerala um, led by women. Okay. Sector. It could be formal involvement and formal involvement. Formal, it means the uh, involvement of women in more, uh, in, in, in the, as part of the system, basically, as part of the government or non government system. And there are informal involvement of women also. So uh, when coming to the formal involvement of women, first we should definitely talk about NDRF. Um, right now, after 2021, like just one year back, women are part of NDRF team, that is National Disaster Response Force team. Uh, in 2021, 100 members of women joined in NDRF. You know, NDRF is um, it's not an agency in which people will be directly recruited. They are usually deputed from other paramilitary organizations. Such such as uh, CISF at all. So these women from CISF and other parliamentary organizations, they joined NDRF. In 2021 January, um, the banks of uh, Ganga River, these uh, women have done uh, contingency work as part of NDRF team. That is a very proud moment because that is the first time in which um, women participated in actually in the ground, they participated in disaster response, not just disaster re relief or um, other works, but actually in ground for disaster response and uh, uh, officially, definitely and officially there will be lots of women participating, but uh, formally. And another proud thing is, uh, is uh, our, uh, the 4th Battalion at Arakonam. There are 12 battalions all over India, in which the, there is this 4th Battalion, which is situated in Arakonam in Tamil Nadu, in which one is uh, Rekha Nambia. She is uh, basically a Kerlite. Uh, she um, was the commandant in CISF. And uh, in 2015, she went into deportation to NDRF, and she led the whole 1,000 um, plus people in, in the 4th Battalion Arakonam NDRF team uh, for different disasters since 2015, such as Kerala flood 2018, Kerala flood and landslide 2019, um, Chennai flood, and all, all these um, situations. She led her team, uh, more than 1,000 people. So it was a very um, big achievement. That is the first time a female commandant was there for NDRF. But it is not just the uh, involvement of women as um, responders, but there are other things involved in disaster management. That is the early warning and other things are there. So first, when we come to the early warning, um, the role of, uh, we know these two organizations very well and their role. Um, first is the ISRO. ISRO is, um, we all know, they have the satellites which talk, which um, 
which will um, uh, give early warning, um, which will say the weather predictions. Uh, so this ISRO, they have mainly two satellites, um, meteorological satellites, basically. And in that, the Hyderabad-based National Remote Sensing Center, uh, NRSC, if you are learning um, about it, you can Google search them. So they are, uh, T, they are in NRSC, the Hyderabad-based um, center, is headed by uh, one day. Deputy Director, Ms. G. Umar Devi, she is um, in administrative capacity there. And um, coming to IMD, that is Indian Meteorological Department, which is actually the nodal agency for um, monsoon, uh, rainfall predictions um, and cyclone warnings, these are given by IMD. So um, in that, in early 1960s and 70s itself, a woman was, um, was uh, working there as a scientist. Uh, one Ms. Anna Mani, she retired as the Deputy Director General of Indian Meteorological Department. Uh, she retired in um, early 90s, I think, but she is the first uh, women scientist um, to uh, become the Deputy Director General um, of IMD. Mm, and she contributed much towards the um, uh, solar wind energy, um, sustain sustainable, basically the sustainable way of uh, the, um, the energy, that is the solar wind energy, um, solar and wind energy. And she helped in um, the standardization of many um, instruments in uh, IMD. So she led, uh, she um, contributed much towards the, um, the early warning uh, system in India. And now the um, Dr. K. Nagaratna, she is the director of Indian Meteorological Department, Hyderabad again. Uh, so right now she is working at the administrative capacity. Here I'm not mentioning about scientists because there are new, um, in number of scientists which are, who are working with IMD and other various um, private players also, they are scientists who are working in um, uh, predicting and um, early warning um, and, uh, early warning system also they are working. So I'm not naming each one of them. I have few friends who are working in Mumbai and uh, who are working in IMD. So they are in contributing much towards disaster management because early warning definitely is a part of um, disaster management. Uh, that was a part of disaster. I don't want to go through each and every names because um, there are n number of projects um, in Orissa, Assam and all because um, these are the places which are much prone to um, disasters. So um, this in Assam, the, there were the women master trainers in uh, first year that they were trained and these women went to the society, to the villages and they trained multiple people at their village level um, for first year. So there were many uh, such projects. I'm not going to each and every one of them. Only this one is very important that is in after 1993, Lato earthquake. This women's self group, because, uh, that was one of the major uh, accident uh, which the public gave so much attention to that is the Lato Rukri, which is one of the reasons why India has a disaster management system right now. You know, this this is one among the disaster which contributed to it. So Lato Rukri is important. So in that they created a network of 3,500 women self-help groups. It's not the number of women involved, but 3,500 women self-help groups were created in 1,064 villages, and these women and they were uh, given. Um, Credits they were supporting in livelihood and other programs, health, education, and other programs. So that was a major initiative, and I have already told they even went to other places to um, train other women. So there was so much um, they, they learned so much, and they were part of the system almost that uh, they could train other women uh, for the um, for the disaster reconstruction activities. Uh, since I'm from Kerala, I would like to mention about the study of um, COVID-19 management in Kerala. Definitely, you know, all know COVID, it is uh, considered as a disaster, even though it is a biological disaster, but it has affected almost all um, span of our life, like every sector it was affected. Um, it affected the social um, society, it affected the economy, it affected almost all the sectors. Uh, so. Uh, in this case study, I would like to mention the role of women um, as um, disaster management professionals in Kerala. Uh, mainly, they were contrib their contribution was in the public health, caregiving and all. 
uh, the first thing which was a proud thing is uh, the uh, Department of Health and Family Welfare of Kerala um, government was led by uh, doc, uh, teacher KK Shailaja. She is uh, uh, she was a um, chemistry teacher and later she became the uh, sorry the um, health minister in Kerala and she was actually doing um, uh, she was actually leading the whole COVID management situation in Kerala. So uh, women led. Uh, right now also later the government changed and then right now also um, the health ministry is led by um, a female um, minister. In that uh, around 8,000 female nurses and um, more than 5,000 JPHNs were working in ground uh, for uh, this COVID management. Um, if you remember in 2020 when the whole lockdown happened, people were not having enough money uh, to manage the uh, to, to feed themselves and all. So community kitchen were uh, made at every se uh, local self-government, that is every panchayats, the community uh, kitchens were started. And these, um, I'm sorry, I'm sitting in the control room. So there will be noises. I'm extremely sorry for that. Um, so uh, uh, the community kitchen special started um, in every um, LSGDs, that is uh, every panchayat, uh, the community kitchen were managed, uh, started and were managed. And they, uh, these women, they cooked the food and ensured that even the um, bedridden patients, every bedridden patient um, were given or every palliative care patient were given sufficient food every day. Uh, similarly, in, in Kerala, one thing is 50% um, of the uh, um, panchayat uh, institution, um, the women representative should be there. Um, that reservation is there, but more than 50%, around 54% of the uh, panchayats were governed by um, women elected representatives, 826. The importance is that these uh, local self-government play a major role in COVID management, not only COVID management. Almost all the disasters happening in Kerala right now are managed at the ground level. If it is a L1 level of disaster, it will be managed by the panchayats itself with the support of uh, other departments. Yeah, so these um, uh, these women representatives, they were managing COVID at the ground level. Um, they were using all the supports they were having um, and local self-government, they were managing the COVID care centers, quarantine of people, um, managing the um, uh, returnees from immigrants, everything were managed at the local level. So these 54% um, women, they were managing it at their ward level um, and, or at their division level, um, the, not only the COVID cases, but also the um, quarantine and all. Uh, coming to the ASHA workers, you all know the importance of ASHA workers, especially during COVID. Uh, 26,475 ASHA workers and more than 60,000 Anganwadi workers, they were contributing for the cotton training and um, finding each and every primary contacts and secondary contacts. Um, there were the, this um, youth volunteer brigade that is a concept developed by the chief minister of india honorable chief minister of uh, sorry so chief minister of kerala i'm extremely sorry chief minister of kerala uh, they are uh, they have asked for professionals um, to um, volunteer for COVID management and around um, more, la more than 3 lakh uh, people registered for that. Out of that, 75,000 uh, 75, women uh, were women. They were volunteering themselves. They were ready to volunteer for the COVID management and later they were used for different activities. This includes doctors, nurses and other professionals. Um, I'm not talking about the general volunteers, talking about the doctors and nurses and other professionals who were ready to volunteer. Uh, and also the police force, you know, they were um, there for um, the lockdown management and all. Then uh, coming to Kudumbashri, you might have heard about Kudumbashri, that is um, the um, women's self-help initiative uh, happened in Kerala in uh, before 2000, in uh, early 90s, um, it uh, started in Kerala. In that, they made a mission, uh, they made uh, they made a program called Chain Call, in which the Kudumbashri um, women, the women in Kudumbashri, they created uh, more than one lakh, um, around two lakh WhatsApp groups, and uh, they were connecting. 2.2 million neighborhood groups. It's not 2.2 million people, but they were managing 2.2 million neighborhood groups. Uh, and in that, the people, um, 
in this all of them were women okay these uh, they were uh, educating these women about the lockdown guidelines because lockdown guidelines if if you were remembering the, it was managed um, it was um, uh, upgraded every day um, sometimes uh, they will ask to our new um, new methods they were changing the rules uh, regularly in every um, two weeks the rules were changing and all so Uh, these women through kudumbashri mission um, these uh, volunteer women they were guiding the uh, neighbor uh, neighborhood groups uh, members to how to um, go with the lockdown uh, guidelines um, social distancing sanitation and other things and that program was uh, called um, change call and uh, the the kudumbashri women they trained um, they were trained in uh, the preventive measures and they were trained to manage covid patients even that uh, it's not always necessary to admit the covid patients in hospital i'm saying like uh, like covid um, care centers but sometimes they will not have any symptom but since they will they are living in um, very densely populated areas like slums and all or if the patient is having some comorbidities um, such as um, hypertension or uh, other disease they should be taken care even if they don't have any covid symptoms so these kodumbashri women they were given training to assess these covid positive patients uh, especially the different abled or um, those who are living in street and all so these um, volunteers um, volunteer women they were supporting these uh, covid patients not talking just about the quarantine people that they were already doing but rather they were supporting um, covid patients also Okay. these uh, they these women they went to each and uh, every households and um, uh, help them to register for covid vaccination you remember the covid um, we need to re- uh, register in that um, and uh, take our turn for uh, the vaccination so these kudumbashri um, volunteers they supported these um, uh, people and ensured that every household know how to register or if they doesn't know these women they help to register uh for the vaccination process and all so these thing um lots of supports um, they have done regarding covid management so that is uh, the general thing about um, role of women uh, i'm sure there are other things also but uh, i'm not going deep into it um and regarding the barriers which women face Uh, as the um, disaster response professionals one is social conditioning women are always taught to be um, uh, what uh, care uh, even though they are the caregivers they always feel that they should be protected and men are protectors so um, usually the role of um, responders or rescuers are usually the men assume that role but that is a social conditioning which women go through and uh, now the ndrf team uh, ha- um, making such changes to include women in the ndrf team um, is breaking that chain of um, social uh, conditioning um, later i'm sure more women will join the forces and um, will be part of uh, the typical roles of society that acts as a barrier lack of knowledge to how to be included in the system or how to be part of the system that uh, lack of knowledge lack of structural support definitely um, even if uh, women want to join um, there will be some guidelines um, in the uh, government system which says that men should apply for that uh, the responders should have certain height which which is standard for men but may not be uh, similar for women so there are some structural um, issues also uh, similarly if you go to a response site you know mm, there won't be sufficient um, washrooms and all and women definitely need it because of their mm, body needs so such structural ch- supports are also lacking um, for women to include involve in disaster response i'm talking about resa- disaster response and also definitely the lack of opportunities not always women are considered as um, um, disaster responders usually um, we consider them as victims or we limit them to um, support the um, local self help group and all but rather they can take the leadership role which uh, there are no much opportunities to be truthful um, so these are the major challenges women face um, to become disaster management professionals and regarding disaster 
a risk reduction there are definitely lots of socio cultural factors um, in which women are not willing to come out of their houses uh, if we are going for a tot for women not many women are ready to come out of their houses um, to participate in the tot and later go to each of these households to um, engage other women women are not um, not getting such opportunities also lack of education contributes to that um, because educated society uh, a progressive educated society will help will always help in um, help women to engage in disaster risk reduction activities so that is also an issue uh, the political environment um, i'm i'm not saying the political parties but the rather the political environment in which um, women are not allowed to leave their houses um, they will be uh, engaged with Mm, family issues things they are married young age um, so they may not be able to uh, become um, study them uh, study or challenge themselves to become uh, disaster response professional so all these um, barriers or challenges women always face uh, while doing disaster response and coming to my last slide this is um, something uh, an initiative at kerala after 2018 flood in 2018 flood there is a place um, which is near to um, ernakulam district of kochi you might have heard it is called chinnamangalam where um, the there are lots of um, people who produce um, clothes um, in which there are traditional people um, who are making clothes and during 2018 flood they are uh, all the instruments um, were um, destroyed and their clothes were completely damaged after 2018 flood so these uh, people they went to, um, they approach a um, few people and then a woman named lakshmi she supported these um, these local um, people they and uh, supported them to create an a doll this doll is called chekuti um, and it is uh, shown as a um, the way kerala overcame a big flood like 2018 uh, so the, it was an initiative by a women and it was later led by women also uh, kind of uh, self help group but it's not the simple uh, no uh, self help group in which they earn a little bit money but rather it was appreciated worldwide and it was self a huge amount and you know? all they were making um, good profit out of that because they lost all their equipments and um, all so that was actually uh, considered as a doll of hope um chekuti and it's quite famous and now uh, so with this i'm winding up so if you have any doubts um please ask me thank you thank you so very much ma'am uh, definitely your presentation was uh, loaded with lots of information and uh, the best part was you presented in a very easy manner so thank you so very much for such a wonderful presentation now uh, the house is open for question answer round if anyone has any questions you can drop your question in the chat box and i can ask on your behalf I'm waiting for the questions. I guess the presentation was complete in a manner, you know that. I mean, there are no queries left with the audience. No, it is All right. actually a comparatively a new topic. I mean, disaster management itself is a new um, topic, and uh, very few women are actually involved in it. Yes, sir. uh dr shija we have heard a lot about 2018 kerala floods yes sir right and there was a lots of devastation at that time yes uh, but uh, what i feel at that time uh, there was a some political rivalry between the center and the state government okay they have not declared it as a national calamity or the disaster and even they have refused to take some aid from the middle east so what is your views if some country is in a distress or in a disaster why we should refuse the assistance which is coming from outside india okay 
Uh, so first thing is that uh, your first two query is about the declaring a disaster as um, as a national disaster. I feel that I have never saw something like a national disaster mentioned in Disaster Management Act or the Disaster Management Policy. There are a few disasters which are um, declared by the central government as national disaster, but there is no policy or um, guidelines for that. So actually, I cannot comment on that, but rather you are coming to your second question, whether taking the support, definitely every nation has taken support from other nations because disaster has no boundaries. Today we help them and uh, next time they help us too. So, disaster have got no boundaries. So definitely there should be um, provisions to take response, uh, uh, the support from other uh, governments, whether it is inside India, because every other state supported Kerala during 2018. Uh, and it should be international also. Why it should limit only to India? It should be there and there should be proper guidelines and there should be um, accountability. If that is a concern, there should be proper accountability how to um, do it. So uh, in my opinion also, it should be there. Uh, Ma'am, there is a query from another participant. Uh, Lakshmi yes. Bhatia wants to know that could you please elaborate on the initiatives for the relief of differentially abled? Okay, differently abled. Um, in fact, Kerala government is the first um, uh, to start an initiative for um, a differently abled in disaster risk reduction. If you go to the Kerala, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority website, you can see that, is, that we have started a project on that in 2018 itself. Mm, yes, 2018 itself, yes. Oh, no, 2017, I think, yes. Mm, so uh, as part of that project, we have trained uh, differently able people um, in two sessions we have trained. First uh, day we trained the physically dis differently able uh, people and the second day we trained the um, parents of mentally dis uh, differently abled um, children. Uh, so after that, uh, we, we trained them for two days, um, trained them for um, giving um, first aid and all, um, all those things. Um, later, regarding the disaster response phase, we have, um, uh, uh, we are trying to address it in such a way that we have uh, asked all the panchayats to collect the details of every differently abled uh, person living in that panchayat, whether it is um, physically different, disabled or um, mentally, or if they are in palliative care um, or bedridden patients. We have asked um, the panchayats and other local self-governments to collect these names and pro uh, provide it to the emergency operations center at the district level and keep it at the panchayat level and also give a copy of that to the nearest police station. And we have give, given um, guidelines to the you know, police and the panchayats to evacuate these people. If in case of any emergency, these people should be evacuated first and then only other people should be evacuated. That is the initiative which we have done. Uh, we are trying to do it. Yes, thank you. I hope I addressed your question, Lakshmi. Yeah, thank you so very much, ma'am. And uh, I'm afraid there's one more question. Um, okay. Sweetie Roy, she wants to know that what kind of socio-cultural factors prevents women participation? Um, it's not everywhere. I'm not saying that it's there everywhere, but it is there socially in few places. If you go and try to talk to the people, um, uh, if we are inviting people, uh, first thing, they are not allowed to leave their house even without the permission of men. And sometimes the men just don't allow women to come out of their houses and participate in such um, uh, classes or sessions. Even if they come out, they are not ready to, you know, basic things like swimming or, you know, making a life jacket out of ordinary things like water bottle. They are not ready to involve, get involved in such activities. Um, that is, there are few, you know, Sometimes women are not, in some places, women are just not ready to participate in it. Mm, definitely social cultural factors. One thing I can remember is the wear, simple sari which women wear, every Indian women wear. Um, it prevented few women from swimming during um, tsunami, um, 2004 tsunami. These, fisher, these fishing community women, they are supposed to know swimming because it's, it, it is something just 
related to the livelihood. But this woman, she doesn't know swimming most of them, and those who know also wouldn't swim in their um, sari. So, uh, if you check the death rate, you can see that double the number of women died due to disasters when compared to men. So, such uh, social cultural backgrounds it stops women from in, in getting involved in um, DRR activities. There are many examples. I'm not going into each and every one, but yeah, these are the first things which are coming to my mind. All right, thank you so much, ma'am. Your presentation was uh, like a step-by-step -step guide to the concerns related to gender sensitivity regarding disaster management. Talking about uh, the formal and informal involvement of women in our system, it was definitely very comforting to know the positive role played by women. Also with the minute details provided by you regarding various women leaders in multiple manners. Also talk how intensely, intensively you have researched on this topic. So at, with this note, I once again thank you so very much on behalf of the entire organizing committee of this training program for being a part of this event and giving a meaning to this association. Thank you so very much, ma'am. Thank you. All right, so moving ahead, I would now like to welcome and invite Dr. Rahul Sharma to this session as a special resource person. Dr. Rahul Sharma is currently associated with Department of Community Medicine, GTB Hospital, Delhi. Dr. Sharma completed both his MBBS and MD from University College of Medical Sciences, Delhi. During his post-graduation, he received the late Dr. Kusum Pandit Award for best postgraduate thesis in the college. He is also a recipient of Ford Foundation IAPSM Epidemiological Research Grant. Dr. Sharma has also been involved in teaching paramedical personnel and a resource faculty in state level workshops organized by Directorate of Health Services Government of NCT Delhi. While talking about, about his topic for presentation today, it is Women in Disaster Risk Reduction, Role of Risk Perception and Beyond. So let's all hear it from you, sir. Over to Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much for that introduction, ma'am. Uh, if you'll just allow me a few seconds to get my presentation going. Sure, sir. Ma'am, um, can you be confirmed? Uh, is my screen showing uh, to all the participants? Yes, sir. We can see. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so, very good afternoon to all who are there in the house assembled uh, for this uh, academic event today. And I begin by thanking the organizers for having me as a part of this uh, noble event and something much required in today's times. And I also thank uh, NIDM for uh, supporting such a noble venture for all of us who are there. So, I would be giving a different perspective to what has been going on so far. I'll just, as ma'am has uh, introduced myself, I belong to medicine side. I'm a faculty in the Department of Community Medicine in one of the medical colleges in Delhi. So what I'll be focusing my session upon is the preventive part of it. You'll have had so many good sessions over the last uh, three days that have been so beautifully planned by the organizers for all of you. What I would be trying to show is, or to discuss with you all is, the important role that women have to play in disaster risk reduction with a special focus on prevention and on this interesting topic of risk perception in that prevention. Uh, those butterflies, I never have animations on my slide for any uh, like aesthetic purpose only. Just Google after the session about butterfly effect, that how a small thing, a small change that we make or if we get about the women to think or perceive the risk correctly, how big an impact it can have in terms of disaster mitigation. I'm beginning with a quote that I came across while preparing for this session. WHO long back, 20 years back has said, and this is a point, point, I'll just read it out for you. It is there on the screens in front of everyone. It is the people who matter the most, including women. And the second part is something I would all request you all to reflect upon. 
that if the people are not there, we would have no disaster. We'd possibly have only physical damage. We would have environmental uh, problem or something. But if the people are not there, possibly many of the disasters would not be caused. Going to the topic of this uh, training program of man-made disasters, and the effect or the impact would not be there. So the people matter. Having gone through the program, I'm sorry, I couldn't be there in the earlier sessions on day one and day two, but what I gather is that these are the sessions that you all have already undergone. We have covered that why gender matters, gender perspective in disaster management. I'll be adding to that in my session also. The role of women, the legal framework was a session uh, just held prior. And as ma'am has just covered, the previous speaker has covered about the role of women as disaster management professionals. What I intend to do in this particular session with you all is to discuss about the concept of disaster risk reduction, to discuss a conceptual framework for the gender dynamics that play out in disaster management or in disaster impact. In community medicine, or it is also sometimes termed as preventive and social medicine, that is the field that I belong to in medical science, we have a concept of prevention. And for that, I would be covering two topics with you all on a short basis. That is epidemiological triad, how are things caused? And something about levels of prevention. When we talk about prevention, there are some levels at which the intervention can be done to prevent or to control the impact of something. My title itself was of the talk was risk perception. So we'll be taking that up in a little bit of detail with one example of what I did with my institution. And we'll be ending up with some topic or some discussion about the various gender differences or nuances that are there, which differentiate between genders in case in terms of disaster impact. So briefly introducing the topic, you have had two sessions or two days full of session of that. The first point begs recurrence multiple times. It has to be reinforced multiple times that the disaster risk reduction begins at home. Whatever the policymakers do, whatever the changes, whatever the influencers want to influence the people with, the final thing what will matter is if people take up whatever you want to tell them, that they actually make it a behavioral change to be doing risk reduction for possible disasters. The risk perception among the community, including women, can by itself be a strong factor which will influence their preparedness or even, even before that, the decision to even be prepared for disasters. The topic is now being researched and this training program shows the importance that this thing has been given now. But so far, if we see in a nutshell of summary across the literature that is available so far, the research on gender differences I'm introducing a term there, vulnerability towards disasters and the impact of disasters when they happen. There are gender differences. Literature has shown that the women and men behave differently and they're impacted differently by the disasters. And a pattern of gender, this is not what something I'm saying. This is what literature shows. This is what the uh, uh, big articles or the reputed cited articles on this topic say, that there is a pattern of gender differentiation men and between men and women at all levels of the disaster preparedness cycle, including the exposure to risk, including their vulnerability, including the perception of what risk they are under, the preparedness, the response, the physical impact, the mental or the psychological impact following a disaster, and even in terms of the recovery and the reconstruction measures. So that is something that has to be factored in while training ourselves to be responding to disasters or while training the women to be acting as responders to disaster. So the first topic that I will take up is the disaster risk reduction. What do we understand by that? The concept and the practice of reducing disaster risk. Uh, I think the definition is there. It's a slightly long one. So what I'll do is you can all, I think it will be visible on the slide for everyone. I'll just highlight the points which are important. I'll just mark the points which are important for reducing disaster risk. That is the topic itself. What we need to do, we need to have systematic efforts. And this shows, if you just go through the training program of this particular one that has been uh, uh, made for you all over three days, you see the eclectic mix of people. I was delighted with that, that we have professionals from so cutting across different specialties. We have medicine, we have disaster specialists, we have hazard professionals and all. So it has to be a coordinated effort of multiple professionals, multiple organizations, all acting systematically to do what? To find out the causal factors 
including reduction of the exposure to the hazards. One part is the exposure. One part is lessening the vulnerability of the people to the particular hazard which is there. There has to be wise and judicious use of the land and environment and that is especially important for a country like ours. That is not resource, th there are limitations to the resources available to us at the macro level or at the micro level when we talk for a family. So wise management has to be done of the land and the environment which is there and improve preparedness for the adverse events which are there. So this together holistically would be coming under the premise or under the function of disaster risk reduction. And this strategy has been given by the United Nations. The UNISDR has set out that this is what they imply by disaster risk reduction. It's a big diagram which is coming up there. I'll not take too much time on this one, but this was the best possible one which I could find about the hazards. Sorry for that. About how the hazards are distribution. And I'm pretty sure, I'm probably sure it may have been covered for sure on the day one or day two, but just quickly going through it. What all hazards are posed and what all hazards can cause disasters are broadly arranged into the natural causes or the man made causes. The natural ones can further be subdivided into the monocausal ones. If a freezing environment of the climate uh, is uh, sub zero, freezing would occur. That by itself would be enough to cause a disaster situation. Or they can be multi causal. Landslide will not occur one, and even, even though what we see is what is happening acutely, it will be long term geological changes, the disbalance of the soil that will finally lead to the acute event happening. Similarly, for the man made causes, which again can be monocausal or multi causal. So this has to be factored in that these are the possible disasters which can be there. They can be, and they all will lead to a disaster if we have a insufficient capacity to respond. And this program to all the audience who are there, who are keenly listening over the last three days, this is part of capacity building of us as responders and of us as agents who will bring about or train the women to be responders. I'll take some time for this one. It seems a little bit well, these are just two intersecting circles which are there. This is a conceptual framework for understanding how gender dynamics play a role in the impact of disaster. There is gender inequality, there is gender inequity, probably different. Some countries have more of that, some countries have less of that. That is the lower blue circle. The red one is the disaster impact. The interface between them, now that's something what we are interested in. Sorry for that. This middle one, which is of a different color one, that is the zone that we are concerned about. That is the zone that we want to impact upon. The impact factors of gender, how gender dynamics or the gender inequity would have an interplay with disaster that will depend upon and that will lead to impact upon the exposure, upon the vulnerability of the people, upon the preparedness of the people, upon the coping capacity. And by and large, it will be the vulnerable gender, that is the women would be bearing the brunt of this. Hazards would lead to disaster, but it would be the interplay of gender dynamics that will lead to whether how much of the impact that would be there when the disaster occurs. And this is primarily where the interplay of those two circles is where disaster risk management wants to focus upon. The gender equity. So issues are mixed. They all are not only medical issues. They all are not only social issues. All of us have to work together. There are societal issues which will lead to gender equity. The presence of hazards would lead to disaster impact. And the two interplaying together. This part, which I originally highlighted is the, is the one that we want to reduce. Let these two circles go away. Let the gender dynamics not have a role to play in the disaster. Let's mitigate both of them. This is a preventive medicine uh, concept. When we want to prevent a disease, when we want to prevent an outcome from happening, in case of disaster, it would be the occurrence of the disaster, first of all, that would be the event. The severity of the injuries, how many people get injured immediately on the disaster or post disaster, how much morbidity happens, how much mortality happens. Now, they all are separate events that we want to pull the person down from. We don't want the person to be climbing that staircase of severity of outcome. And what all we can do is broadly arranged into these four categories of what prevention we can do. There's something called as primordial prevention. There's something called as primary, secondary, and tertiary. 
I take you all back to the old proverb that was there that because of a nail the kingdom was lost because the horse's uh, foot I think uh, the wedge was there the nail was not put and there's a nice um, uh, rhyme on that that how the finally the kingdom was lost so prevention is better than cure I firmly believe in that that is the discipline I have subscribed to and the earlier the prevention the better so these all from top to bottom represent the earlier prevention that we're doing primordial basically is the prevention of the behavior, the risk factors itself from developing. In Hindi, if we say, Jad se khatam kar diya, na rahega baas, na ki baansuri. If smoking is not there in society, all the cancers subsequent to that would not be there. Primary prevention would be individual specific. Preventing the individual from having the behaviors that may prone the person to disaster or the may prevent a person prone to diseases. Your disaster preparedness would come here. That Society as a whole, if we become prepared, if the individual becomes prepared, if he takes mitigating or preparatory steps, that would not lead to the event of damage from disaster happening. Secondary prevention would be that the event has happened, the disaster has happened. You want to catch the people or you want to reach to them at the earliest possible, you want to minimize the immediate part of it at the earliest possible. Tertiary prevention is you want to mitigate, uh, sorry, uh, tertiary prevention is you want to prevent the complications at the end of it, the long term sequelae. You want to rehabilitate the people and all, and that is something that you want to do. I'll take a non medical example for this. Uh, sorry, I, I will take a medical example for this. That is how prevention of smoking works. All these four steps. In terms of prevention of smoking in the society, primordial, the root prevention is that you don't have the society smoking at all. You discourage the children right at the step from adopting the harmful lifestyle ever. Primary would be asking an individual not to smoke or choose not to start. Secondary would be that the person who is a smoker, now you're wanting to prevent the person from catching any other further lung illnesses and all and finally lung cancer. So you want to do tests and all to be able to capture the person at the earliest possible. And tertiary would be that the person it was a smoker, the person unfortunately developed lung cancer, and now you're trying to do damage control, you're trying to rehabilitate the person, you're trying to prevent severity of the complications. I don't have a slide on that, but if I put this in context of or taking the outcome as disaster or the disaster uh, damage or the mortality or the death from disaster as the outcome instead of lung cancer, primordial will be that disaster preparedness becomes an ingrained principle of all of us we don't have buildings that are prone to disaster. We have safe buildings. We have among the many things which are all the steps which have been discussed with you. Primary would be that a specific individual makes disaster preparedness or disaster risk a part of uh, his or her normal life. Secondary would be that the person is living in a disaster prone zone. The person is prone to disaster severity. He has opportunity to be taking some steps. There are some interventions possible for reducing the complications living in a disaster prone zone. Tertiary prevention would be that the disaster has happened, that mass casualty or the mass injuries have happened. We are having facility at the hospital level. There are trauma technicians. There are people who are or there are teams of professionals who are there to reach them within the golden hour and to be able to capture or to take them for the sophisticated or the available required complex medical care. So this gamut of prevention was something I wanted to share with all of you. That is something ingrained. That is something that at the essence of preventive medicine, that the more left you go, the more you start from primordial, the better. And usually not so, but if you also appreciate one more thing, the final step, the tertiary prevention measures, setting up sophisticated hospitals, setting up trauma care, setting up the ambulance system to cover entire India, the larger you will go to a tertiary, the more cost impact or the most cost you will have to input into the system by and large. Not always, but usually that is the case. So from disaster risk reduction, the crux of my talk today, the concept of risk perception, how much that plays a role in disaster risk reduction or the willingness of the people to listen to whatever you're saying and wanting them to do. So what is risk perception? The people's understanding and response to the risk in terms of change in behavior for tackling the situation, whatever it is, which may or may not be appropriate to the risk they are exposed to. 
So that is the perception of the people. It somehow sometimes becomes imbalanced, that the perception is not in terms with the actual situation. What does that depend upon? Say so something which is the real risk and there's something which is the perceived risk. Uh, I'm not sure if somebody else's uh, previous to me has distinguished between there's something called as hazard and there's something called as risk. We usually use the terms interchangeably. Hazard is the presence of something, is the presence of some mitigating or the underlying situation which will lead to some bad adverse outcome from happening. For example, the presence of a stone on the road on which usually motorized uh, vehicles go, that is a hazard. The presence of a nuclear plant in a city or the presence within a city, that is a hazard. The risk is two things. One is the probability of something going wrong. The probability of a vehicle, of a bike or of a car. If a car goes, nothing much will happen. If a two-wheeler topples over, so what is the probability of somebody going undergoing that hazard or that hazard manifesting itself? Multiplied by the severity of whatever will happen. If the bike is at 100 km per hour, the severity will be much, much more. It can possibly be fatal if the two-wheeler topples over. If a nuclear plant, the probability of <coughs> sorry, a nuclear radiation being there or a nuclear accident being there, there is minimal. But if it happens, the severity is huge. The city would be there, gone for years and years altogether, decades altogether, like what happened in Chernobyl, what happened in Fukuyama earlier in Japan. So the real risk is the probability of that hazard multiplied by the severity. This is something which can scientifically be calculated. You can do modeling and all to see what is the actual risk of various disasters, natural or man-made. What the community feels is the perceived risk. What they feel is the hazard plus what I've highlighted there, something which is the outrage. How much do you feel emotional? How much do you feel connected to the risk which is actually there? Let me try to give you one example I've taken from somewhere. The differentiating between the actual hazard or risk and the perceived risk. If you can see there's a line, there's a horizontal line in between. And there are two circles of every disaster that is shown there. Towards the top is what the public feels. How much is the perception of risk by the people at large when you ask them. Below that horizontal line is the actual measurement of the hazard or of the risk as measured by scientific methods. For example, let's take one of them, terrorist attack. People, whenever, God forbid, the terrorist attack happens, it's highlighted so much by the media, it is so much, so much in the news and all, that the people will feel, the people feel that there's a very big risk of terrorist attack happening. Whereas when you see that how much is the extent of terrorist attack, rarely if ever you would have a terrorist attack that will impact the entire city. There have been occasions, but thankfully very less in history with the probability of the severity of how much mass impact one single attack will have. So if you see, that's a very tiny dot actually, but the people's risk is much, much more. That will lead to a negative brohaha about it. There'll be more of panic about it. Let's compare it to the reverse situation. Something as common as heat. People die of heat. People die of heat exposure. People die of heat stroke and all. And many, many people do die wherever there are abrupt changes in the climate or if the people are not appropriately dressed as per the climate. But the perception of the people is low because it doesn't hit the news. It doesn't come in the main report. It doesn't come on uh, the TV channels continuously that people died of heat today. So in that case, the second medical example is cancer or car accidents. They are so common. They are, they are uh, every day happening that people don't really bother. That, that's not something that will linger on in your mind. Terrorist attack or a plane crash, since it's covered so extensively in media, the extent of perception of that risk skews compared to what it actually is. A big slide, but just covering a few of the points that what leads to the perceived risk being lower than what it actually is. If it's something of a daily event, if it's something not memorable, you don't really remember one car accident because they happen so often. A plane crash, usually you will remember. I remember those two planes which disappeared over uh, Malaysia and all because there was such an uncommon occurrence. Something which is chronic, which will slowly kill Something which is acute, which is catastrophic, is has more recall value. Media coverage is definitely a part of that. The effects which are reversible will not heat something which can be reversed. But still, it's a tragedy that people are losing their lives to heat exposure. Something which is familiar, something which is understood. 
that is more likely to be there something like covid created so much and rightly so there was so much of panic about that because it was killing people but we tend to forget that some one of our long term enemy tuberculosis has been there with us for so long we are still to fight win over it the program is doing very well but still a large number of indians are dying of tuberculosis but that doesn't hit the media that doesn't is not shared over whatsapp as much as something which is new something which is unfamiliar and one emotional one the age groups which are involved where children are not the victims that is something which will people then whenever something which hits the children that is something which is perceived to be of much much higher risk that is there in the society or the community as a whole titanic if you all remember the so called unsinkable ship so what is there in front of you is a iceberg now this is a actual picture of iceberg you will find that a little bit odd because what we see usually is the one above that is towards the top of the water level there's a simple physics concept behind it i think there will be many many people more um, uh, expert of physics than me but i think it's to do with the specific gravity of ice it is ice floats on uh, water but a large part of it about 80% of it is below the actual iceberg is below and that is a problem with risk perception that what is visible to us risk is many times highlighted by what the media shows us what we see in the media what we regard to be unfamiliar whatever is striking a mind and all whereas the larger part something which is actually causing the deaths and all that tends to escape the public mind and in this particular risk perception why i took up this topic or why this topic was taken up as a part of the training program is that women have a large part to play in how this can be balanced back to normal balance back to what risk assessment should be a perception should be because studies have shown that women in general over males have a higher sense of risk perception of actually what that is the males are more of risk takers or of risk ignorers if you want to call them so a woman member of a family would have a large part to play in setting the things right for the members of the family as a whole uh just to complete the story one part would be this the second part would be a reverse of it that there will be some risk where the actual you think it to be a big one whereas actually in generality the risk for an individual member of the community is very low so the reverse of that can also be possible which we have already covered the perception may not may not coincide with the risk level as determined that this thing is something we have already covered people underestimating this if you overestimate this, the people who are overestimating the risk they are wasting resources there may be some mental issues they may be causing anxiety and stress to themselves and to those around them to the medical they may be overburdening the medical system but the bigger risk would be the people underestimating the actual risk that is a major problem and it is a humongous challenge because how does a person change his or her behavior when he or she does not perceive the risk to be there why would they be amenable to whatever you are telling them to do why should the cyclist be driving on the cycle lane only with that government bills across roads when for years they have been driving cycling through the roads cutting across traffic and all it requires behavior change it requires big motivation from our part to get behavior change to happen and communication either at the mass level through mass media to the social media between group level that is you pick uh, school children or you pick mahila groups you pick mahila mandals which are there in urban areas or interpersonal level that has to be the networking has to be done between people for the change of this risk perception to be brought about i'm taking one example from disasters how risk perception can be there what can be the factors which are influencing this perception either inflating it or deflating it i'm taking the example of flood risk they can be cognitive factors cognitive is what is there in your mind worrying whether you ever had exposure to floods in the past someone who has seen what uh, disaster what situation floods bring would be more amenable to whatever you would now telling him or her to do there would be demographic and socio economic factors age gender would be a factor in the risk perception towards floods education household size home ownership and i'll refer back to the slide after a few slides from now because we in our institution actually did a study where we tested all these points that education socio economic status is it making a difference in the risk perception or not geographical factors that what is the type of building what is the location 
can influence your risk perception. If you're living in a solid building, you may be having that false sense of security that even if a flood comes to my house, nothing will happen. And informational factors. How much aware? Now, this is one point where our role as a responder towards disaster or as a disaster management professional begins that spreading awareness, increasing the awareness, and having more of reach towards the people. What I mentioned last slide, the communication at a personal level or at a group level to bring about change in the behavior. Uh, I am not sure whether I'm allowed to ask any participant to unmute himself or herself. We'll not do that. But if you all can ponder, what can this particular slide be? I'll be the answer will be coming up in 10 seconds. This is one of the what do put a public health blots in India's history. That junk laden fact, it seems to be a, a swell fact. Whenever man made accident in an industry comes, the first incident that will come to everyone's mind is the Popal gas tragedy. This is the present state of the company. I think December 2nd, 1984, though, overnight, the intervening night between 2nd and 3rd December 84 was when there was a gas leak from a pesticide factory located in the city of Bhopal. And I think whether you were alive at the time, whether you were born at the time or not, everyone here, someone who's been in India would know about the thousands of deaths that were there at that time. And I was mentioning about tertiary prevention. The sequelae has been there even today. Till today, the next generations are suffering the consequences of exposure to the gas that day. Why I'm showing that is, this was an analysis. If you see the footnote, I've given the references from where I picked up these tables or the diagrams or the text that I'm sharing with you all. So there was a project appraisal. There was an analysis of what led to it. It was a risk study of uh, why something went wrong. Forget about the other columns. Please don't uh, read what is there in the table. From the prevention part of view, I'll just bring about one category of failures that was identified. I'll just read out what I've highlighted here. The information on precautions of how to minimize MIC effects was not communicated to the people. You, you were building a pesticide company in the middle of a city. Nobody really bothered or nobody thought of training the entire community about what is to be done in case the MIC exposure is there. Second question for all of you, if you all know what does MIC stand for? That was the particular gas, the particular chemical which leaked that day, that was methyl isocyanate. So what is to be done if you're feeling a gas, if you're feeling a leakage, half of the town, 90% of the town was asleep at the time when it happened. But what is to be done when you wake up, when you're feeling that something is wrong? What are the immediate steps? That was never communicated. Risk communication was not done. Not informing public about the possible emergency in the neighborhood and significance of alarm siren. The immediate response, the secondary prevention, disaster has happened, the gas has leaked. People didn't know that what is the significance of this alarm that has gone off. How to respond? How much is it importance to respond? So just from this one uh, unfortunate incident in our history, I'm just making to, or telling or making it evident to all of you that what is the importance of risk communication for the community as a whole. And again, I'll repeat that same point that the women members of the family We'll have to begin from the families for the entire community to be effectively changed. Uh, towards the end of my presentation now, I'll just take 10 minutes to share a small study that we all did at our, my institution. We did a study about risk perception, about various disaster situations among homemakers. So let me clarify that we didn't take women in general. Since the study was done during morning hours, during the office hours, we thought that the women at home would be the ones who are homemakers. So we selectively took the group of homemakers only. That didn't make much of a difference because in the particular areas that we went to, only about 10 to 15% of the women were working outside for income. 75 to 80% of the women were homemakers only. It was a community-based study. We went home to home <coughs> to actually inquire from the women and uh, 754 women from representative, we selected four colonies to represent the socioeconomic spectrum. I'll show that in the next slide in a part of East Delhi. And the age of the women at home ranged from 21 to 80. So that was a huge thing we had covered. So what we did was we picked up population proportionate sampling that among the areas which are there in that East Delhi, among the colonies uh, which are there, we broadly categorized them into four categories. A resettlement colony is something specific to India. It is where the people were erst while living in the Juki Jopris or the illegal uh, shanties. The government, rehabil sorry, the government rehabilitated them. 
they were given pakka houses and all they were allotted plots where they build their own pakka houses but still it represents the lowest socio economic status housing lig mig hid simply stand for low income group middle income group and high income group so that this was taken from the mcd classification of the colonies themselves we didn't classify them as lig mig hid and before we go for uh, some of them or some of you may note that the hig was very very low as compared to the other three categories that was simply because in that east delhi areas the hig colonies were actually very less as compared to the other three colonies population wise uh education of the women was virtually all from illiterates to graduates to even professionals everything was covered so what we asked them was we asked them a simple question that how concerned are you about the file i'll just go a little bit quickly because this was just one example of a study on risk perception that we did eight disaster situations that we had pre decided eight major disaster situations were asked about and they were just asked to respond that whether they are not at all concerned about that affecting their com community one is there was somewhat so there was a roughly a scale was there from not concerned to very concerned i'm straight away showing the results that we found so among the eight that we asked about people were most concerned three four three in every four women that we interviewed was concerned some or very much about earthquake fire swine flu you see that because at that time this study was done a few years ago at that time swine flu just prior to that swine flu had been a scare floods do happen there is actually a flood control office there in east delhi but people were less concerned about terrorist attacks famine windstorm and war this was one part that whether they were concerned or not we had categorized them into not concerned somewhat concerned and very concerned the second interesting thing we did was we calculated two things one was the level of concern which i have already shown two slides earlier that 75% of people had concern or not about earthquakes the severity of concern we measured at how many said the ratio of very concerned to somewhat concerned so severity would be that if the lady is saying that very concerned uh, part was higher that means the severity of that concern was higher and we use those two in pieces of information to draw or to come up with this particular graph where the balls are placed where the circles are placed that is according to the what i have already shown in the previous slide the earthquake was the one what they were most concerned about war was people were least concerned about the size of the ball or the diameter of the ball that represents the severity of the concern let me take one example so this was an interesting finding that we had at the time that <clears throat> people are concerned about earthquake and since the size of the ball is actually also high they are concerned about the severity also taking up something like windstorm people are not concerned but people also think that the severity if it happens will be lesser war the probability or the level of concern is least but they do think that in case war happens the severity of impact would be high which unfortunately is happening in a part of the world right now so these two things together i would suggest or i would put forward for the house to consider is something that will determine the risk perception of the community and that is something that will determine how amenable they would be to whatever steps we are asking them to take so it will be not just the risk perception alone but also the severity of the perception of risk this part i'll just quickly go through if you remember that slide couple of slides ago that education makes a difference um socio economic status makes a difference this was just how many proportion of the respondents were concerned about disasters age did not make a difference the red and this is a statistical concept green means that it was a significant difference red means that both were equal that even though it is showing 53 and 51 they were roughly equal only education what we saw was a increasing one the people who were higher educated the women the study was done only among women who were homemakers so more educated women appreciate the risks more 57 of us of them were concerned about some disaster and only if the concern is there only then the thought of preparedness would begin locality if you remember the four study a four colonies had talked about resettlement colony right up to hig again a increasing trend was seen and similar was the case with social economic sorry for that similar was the case with social economic status i hope that's a very poorly drawn one that is increasing to show the increasing one there was one aberration that the upper middle had a higher one as compared to upper but overall if you see the trend 
the higher socioeconomic status, people belonging to a higher locality and people who were more educated were more likely to be concerned about disasters. One other facet of a study was the actual preparedness. That was the risk perception part. The disaster preparedness part was asked about in two questions. I, uh, because of positive time, I did not arrange the other slide. One was that, what do the women feel? Are the items that they want to have in the house? This was an open question. These choices were not given to them. And the second question was that out of these things, how many do you have for three days supply? Very rare responses were some said only less than three said emergency light, some said guns for protection. So that was a unique thought because probably because of war and all. But the general response was that food, water, mobile phone. What I would want to highlight is people forgot about torch, that you will require a torch if electricity is cut down. You will require batteries for the torch. So these were things really not in the women's mind. People really don't have fire extinguishers at their home. So this is something I would want to bring you on. And something that we take for a given, that first aid box hona chahiye. Only 20% of the women could recall that first aid box is part of the disaster preparedness kit that they should be having at home. The second part of it was, uh, unfortunately, the part is not there. Mobile phone, if you see, was there about in 46% of the women, but only about 15 to 16% had mobile phone, which has the battery for three days worth life. So in that way, the feature phone is better because smartphone ko aapko charge karna padega and you may not have electricity at home. And uh, unless you have, uh, many of the phones don't allow you to have a spare battery also. So what good will be your mobile phone if the batteries are, are run off in one day? What will you charge it with in case of a disaster situation? It was a cross-section study. Only the current perceptions of the homemakers were studied. At that time, swine flu was recency in mind. So that's why swine flu, the concern was high. This may not reflect their actual or the future behavior. It may give us the baseline, but it may not reflect what the persons will actually do when a disaster strikes. And the third one holds because we had only asked about, it was not an open study, we only asked about eight selected situations. There were variations in them. That was what the study finally said, that there were variations in the perception and concern. These varied with the social demographic characteristics. Education made a difference, social economic status made a difference, and that shows us that among the women, which are the ones we want to first highlight, which are the more vulnerable, which are the ones which require our intervention more. So this, I think, has been covered. I am going uh, encroaching a little bit on the other sessions uh, topic also, but quickly going through that, what are the gender differences? The hazards themselves that cause disasters, cause disasters may by themselves be gender neutral. Flood will not make a difference between male and female. Fire will not make a difference between male and female but the impacts are not, they are not gender neutral. Different relations, levels of exposure and vulnerability are driven by the gender relations, by the gender equations, by the gender inequity or inequality in the society. Women tend to perceive risk more, and that is something we can use. This is a biological fact. Multiple studies have shown that, that women tend to perceive risks more saliently, and this is something that we can use, and that is why women can have an important leadership role in disaster risk reduction for the family and consequently for the community as a whole. Women may have lower access to ICT. ICT stands for Information Communication Technology. Smartphones, mobile phones, even though they are so ubiquitous now, you will usually find, at least in the areas that we go to on a daily basis, that if it's a lower socioeconomic area, if there's one phone in the household, usually you will find it will be the with the male. He will be having the one having access to SMSs. So if you're sending out some SMS messages, for disaster preparedness, if you want to send out some orange alert that something is happening, it will be, if the phone is with the male of the family, he will be the one responding, not the woman. So lower access to bank accounts, formal sources of finance may impact the woman's ability to cope and recover in the aftermath of a disaster. And policies. So what we need to do as the participants here at our level, what we need to convey to the policymakers, the policymakers also have to be sensitized the gender dynamics have to be taken into account. You can't have a one size fits all thing for disaster management or for disaster response. And we need to do, do this without exacerbating the existing gender gaps. If there's a disaster, if there has been a flood, you open a ration center at one corner of the village in good faith. But if it is the males only who are going out, only if they are the ones competing for getting the rations for the family, that is exacerbating the gender gap there. 
The Sentai framework given in 2015, it recognizes the significant role of women in disaster preparedness, response and recovery. And it's high time that we as a country also start to emphasize that. And this program is a very, very important step and a very noble initiative towards that. Enhancing women's leadership in promoting all across the spectrum of disaster response, right? From the preparedness to the reconstructive approach, to the rehabilitation also, women can and need to play an important leadership role in that. And ending up with a little bit, so what is the way forward? Ensuring the women's representation, and this, again, I'm cutting across all probably the sessions that have been taken so far. It is not just a, a summary from my session only. What we need to do is ensure the women's representation in civic protection, in aid and community outreach, in channeling the disaster response. There are already are groups. There are Mahila Mandals, there are Asha, there are ANMs and all. They are, they can be used. The existing systems can be used. The existing groups need to be utilized in planning for a disaster response optimum utilization of the resources already available. Social protection schemes of the government, social protection programs and all can be used to address specific preparedness needs of the families. And we need to have training and early warning system that needs to be inherent in India. That is somehow so woefully missing that we need to have an alert system like you have in the coastal areas for flood and all. So those early warning and preparedness systems need to be developed. Let's not wait for the disaster to happen. Let's be prepared and let's have our community prepared for any possible disaster. Legal framework, and that's why you had a session on that, that identifying the gender gaps and filling them up in our legal system needs to be there. Community sensitization on the evacuation. So these are very basic generic ones across the disaster management cycle. What all to be done? And the women need to be provided and they should be receiving the community planning system and ensuring that ICT, that's ensuring that the early warning messages that you're emanating, you want everyone to know that. But unless everyone has a mobile phone, they would not be able to do it. So you want to reach out to everyone and you want the information to reach out first to those who are most at risk, the vulnerable, the marginalized, and the ones who are at home, possibly are the ones that you want your messages to be reaching. So these were in a nutshell, the steps that can take us away forward. That was all uh, from my side. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope uh, this discussion about the importance of prevention, the importance of going as earlier in time as possible was something that uh, you all found useful. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, Dr. Rahul. Thank you. Definitely your presentation was like uh, full of information. And quickly we'll move to the question answer round. <laughs> we have a question from a student, Swati. She wants to know that uh, are there any steps which the government is undertaking to teach the common people about the methods of disaster risk reduction? Okay, thank you so much for that question. Uh, Rati. There, there are many steps. NIDM, I think I would say this training program itself represents one of the big steps that the government is taking. NIDM is sponsoring these steps and all. We have uh, exercises, we have disaster preparedness exercises which are there. Uh, in a way, the response to the disaster would also be a part of uh, the disaster uh, mitigation or the disaster risk reduction. Talking specifically about what all things are being done right from the school upwards and all, uh, I wouldn't be having access to all the data possible. But yes, the agencies are planning steps for that. There are uh, steps, probably someone else who is dealing with school and uh, very frankly, are not the ones dealing with school programs or college programs and all. What I do know is we have exercises at the large level. Demex exercise was held some time back in Delhi, where a large scale community involvement was there to see for the preparedness of the response of all. But whatever I'm, uh, is tri uh, striking me right now are all disaster response mechanisms. You've asked a very good question about risk reduction. So for that, the steps which are being taken is probably something that disaster experts can uh, better tell about that. Thank you, sir. Uh, there are two more questions. Uh, like Sandhya, she wants to know that uh, risk is something that is much more from which is visible from outside. Then why it is so the government have an uh, unserious attitude towards the sale of alcohols, stimulants, even assets, which proved to be hazardous for women. Quite interesting. <laughs> Oh, that, 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 I think, I think the heckles will be up. I think all women's uh, groups will be starting with that. But, but yes, so first of all, the question is much appreciated. 
uh, that is a question uh, alcohol and tobacco are something that uh, like there's always a discourse or there's always a dichotomy between uh, public health between what the scientists will say and what the government there are some practical limitations to it i i will do contest one of the points that you wrote in the question the question uh, uh, is not visible to me but you mentioned about acid no that was something that something very strong has been done that acid has been banned you can't just go outright and purchase it from any shop now having said that i know immediately your response would be that it is the implementation which is making a difference so probably i'm going upside or uh, over my charge here the two questions together the one asked by srishti i think earlier and the one that has been asked by you the point to ponder i want to give to all of you is that we are shifting aren't we shifting things to government they are meant to do the job yes we can take them to task for whatever they are not doing whatever they are not implementing properly but at the same time our role as professionals if the asset is not meant to be sold how come like is it only for the government to monitor and go at every um, nukkad ka shop or everywhere that uh, it has been clandestinely been sold or the law is not being followed so the implementation the community awareness has to be there jago grahak jago that kind of a thing we all are customers we all are clients of public health i would say and the onus is upon us to be agents of change uh, if the if the organizers will allow me this because this is actually something i feel very strongly about that let's ask let's keep the government on the foot let's uh, keep them on the toes let's ask them questions but let's also be aware of what all we are doing that are we making the change enough uh, when on diwali and all the crackers was there the school health program was used that forget the adults wo patake jalayenge the young school children were targeted the school those children become the agents of change and when the child goes back and says to the parent that the pollution is there i don't want you to be causing or uh, please don't buy crackers what would the parents end up buying it for and not just acid uh, all of you who are in offices all of you who ever spill or ever have a uh, official document where the something needs to be erased something needs to be changed there has been a big change till some time ago you had that whitener that whitener fluid used to come in easily accessible bottles now you can't procure the bottle anywhere the government made that change that eraser fluid has not been banned the whitener ink has not been banned the sale of that in a bottle format has been banned you can only avail of that as a pen now if anyone has used that the whitener wa ink wala aapka sirf pen format mein aata hai and the reason for that is to minimize substance abuse so steps are being taken i would uh, just uh, like uh, provide back to you the government is taking steps now alcohol and tobacco is a big story alcohol per se now uh, i'm saying it in official forum like there have been studies on that it is the excessive consumption of alcohol or the chronic consumption of alcohol or the binge consumption of alcohol or the consumption of country alcohol that makes a difference in all wherever government can take a step they are taking steps tobacco is a story because there is a lot of economics linked to it there are huge practical economic implications for low or for the developing countries which preclude and that is why those other messages are there when you have that uh, cigarette packet i think uh, you and me go to a movie there is no movie in india without that prevention message coming up there there is no cigarette packet which is sold without 80% of the area not having that sinister warning So just think back. I am leaving the question unanswered. But if a person is there who is paying money to buy a packet of cigarettes, who is seeing that lung cancer ka ganda sa photo on top of that, which is a huge one, he is buying something which writes "smoking kills." So can the entire focus be shifted to government alone? You and me, uh, if you are a person living in Delhi, we drive on Delhi roads. We wear seat belt. How many of us are wearing a seat belt only for the risk of the chalan and not because actually we think it is important? for those who have been driving some time but now it has become second uh, uh, nature for you you first actually put the seat belt and then you put your ignition on the problem is that there has to be change for this one also ah uh, yes shreya has written back there was one notification i am getting we all know that there are so many laws and rights yes there are and the laws are being modified there are there there are some ancient laws there are some uh, like historical victorian era laws which are being repudiated now but the implementation of the law is something which is the government's responsibility but which is something of our responsibility also if i may and i think this uh, discussion of this answer has gone a little long because you just got me on the my raw now this is something which really i am passionate about cctvs the government probably says that we have got 1 lakh cctvs 1.5 lakh cctvs across delhi now but if you go back and read this is it a good system that where you are having to rely upon cameras 
to be able to prevent crime from happening so same way do you want the government only to be having steps ki aapko agar building banana hai to usko aapko strong banana you don't want the building to be falling in four hours you don't want there was a case in gurgaon that a person was having tea in his uh, first floor house and the entire building five floors came crashing down on him there were i think two lives lost in that unfortunate incident so government has to play its role but we also have to be a important part of that i'm so sorry i totally missed out i think while trimming the presentation i missed out about the epidemiological triad that was a slide that i missed out upon i had committed to that in the one i'll just quickly go through that there's a triad of causation there are some agent factors there are some host factors and there are some environment factors in case of tuberculosis if you release the tuberculosis bacteria not everyone will catch the severe form it it will be the ones who are immunocompromised the ones who are having a pre existing illness the ones who are malnourished that will be the host factor the agent factor will be the more virulent form of tb <coughs> sorry tuberculosis environment factor would be poverty low ventilated dark rooms and all. i'm just giving a medical example so similarly the agent host triad the government the policy makers the actual doers who are working towards making those buildings the ones who are constructing them the ones who are making the roads for us the ones who are drawing the traffic signals and we the customers or the clients all three of us combined need to have a role in that only then the triad can succeed and only then the prevention can happen apologies for the long answer i hope that satisfied you to some extent uh no so we we thoroughly enjoyed your uh, explanation to our queries it was like um you cleared their doubts thoroughly uh, there is one more question sir um okay srishti mehta she wants to know that uh, people in india in specific women are ready to deal with the impact of situation going on in ukraine uh, i missed out the last part i am someone not able to see the can can you just uh, are the what was the last part of the question okay 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 i'll just read out again that uh, do you think that people of india in specific women are ready to deal with the impact of situation going on in ukraine okay uh, first and foremost i don't know how that fits into the current discussion and all uh, if you ask me I, even i don't know how much uh, i am ready to fit in with that probably if that same study if we do in our uh, area east delhi or south delhi now now that war wala ball will go up largely now because that is something out there no that was just on light because you took me by um, i think the questions are such a eclectic mix i was not expecting so many different variety of questions and all i i don't think any one of us is prepared none of us is prepared for the impact of something unfortunate happening something which is now playing and that is one big part uh, i think the gulf war was the one where the war actually came into a living rooms that was when the cnn and the cable tv came for the first time when you hear that some uh, war is happening and when you hear that people are dying that is one different thing when you actually see those missiles going across night sky when you see that uh, buildings being bombed when you see a row of tanks moving when those visuals play out in front of you the value of that or the recall value of that and definitely the risk perception would be increased whether the community as a whole is ready no i and what what has made us ready that like, is there any part do we have a curriculum on war preparedness do we have a emergency response as of not things are changing but in school time we have those is ncc a mandatory part for everyone not yet so probably it is left to the individuals on themselves to respond and yes you are i think the point if i get it correctly what you are trying to make is there would be deep psychological stress for many of us there would be deep psychological stress on the children who are at home who are doing online classes who are accessing mobiles and on and who somehow get to see those visuals and all so yes that has to be factored into it as one and probably again you will say that it will not be the government who can come and do something about it it will have to be the self help groups it will have to be our whatsapp groups who will have to take care of each other if somebody is showing signs of stress and somebody everyone should have someone to be talking to someone i believe in that buddy system that everyone has at least one buddy designated a friend of yours childhood friend or otherwise a designated pair of yours who you can listen to and who can listen to your thoughts about it so i i don't know if the audience i would love to have your feedback back it can be a long discussion but probably the training programs format is such but yes all of us need to be ready of the things which are happening around us the world of globalization is such that a virus from somewhere comes to us the war from somewhere or its repercussions economic ones will definitely come to us and we need to all probably that will be something that we all educationists need to think that uh, whether those civics and economics that we had in our school syllabus whether that can prepare the children at least 
for making them mentally stronger for responding to war situations. We do agree with you, sir. And uh, there's one last question. Um, uh, it's coming from Sweetie. She wants to know that, uh, sir, do you think media is responsible for exaggerating the low risk of damage caused by any mishaps? What are your opinions about this? Thank you. Thank you, Sweetie. Uh, that, that, that is a given. I think I showed that in the part of my presentation also. Uh, media have a job to play. They have those that TRP is the most important thing for them. So that is across. Now, I won't be blaming any one channel for that. That will set off a very passionate debate that uh, this channel is the one doing it. This is a loud uh, spoken one. Ultimately, we are the ones watching it. Ultimately, we are the ones promoting it. Media sensationalizes because we are the ones who are capturing it. And I would not say it is not intrinsically bad. If, if there's something wrong, if there is a, 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 like a, a murderer out in the open, you would want the impact to reach everyone, everyone to be aware, ki, be on the lookout for this person X. However, overdoing things, and yes, they do tend to overdo things. But can I throw the question back to you? That when we have a war, when we have economical situations going on, isn't it that all of us watch that IPL auction? Isn't it our priority also, which is misplaced? It is not just the media, which is the media is feeling. You know, if you talk to the media professional, their stand is we are just whatever the people consume, that is what we are fetching to them. One caveat I would add, one thing which has happened is the, de the democratization of uh, risk communication. Now we're not anymore reliant only on the mass media or the TV channels alone. The social media is having a big role to play and it has its own brick, uh, like bouquets and brick pads both. The ease of or the faster travel of information, even on the Ukraine war that we are talking about, I think uh, probably if you want to have it follow it on the real time, the visuals and all the videos and all what is happening in real time is much, much more faster than social media on Twitter or on uh, Instagram or on Facebook as compared to the traditional media television methods. With that, the second part is that even in that, if you will see, if you'll just recall the WhatsApp messages or you just go through the WhatsApp messages you got today, the ones which are more viral are the ones which are more likely to be more conspirational or the one controversial or the ones which will have high impact on you. So yes, media has a role in that. Media needs to be restrained in its uh, attitude. But the same thing applies to us, that we need to be better consumers of information that is being selected to them. And as, a, as a doctor, we always say, I teach my students that a doctor needs to be a critical consumer of information. When we are writing a paracetamol for you, when we are writing an ampicillin for you, there are possibly dozens of brands who all are trying to sell. Their, their uh, uh, profitability, they are corporates. Their profitability is linked to their brand being sold more. The MRs and all come and try to tell, convince the practicing doctors that uh, this brand is better. This is the reason why it is better. The doctor needs to take a conscious decision, taking all the facts in front of him or her into account, that actually which one is better. So just like that, that was one analogy that I was trying to give. We all need to be critical consumers of the information that media is giving to us, those uh, WhatsApp or the social media is giving to us, and then need to take a thing forward. Uh, when I'm, I'm sorry for that extra time I'm taking. One simple example I give it is, I have a, all of you may be having your professional WhatsApp groups and all where your friends are there. I have my own college group where everyone is a doctor. And so often I find that misinformation or something that was seeming to be uh, like a very viral thing, even a doctor is forwarding it. It just takes five seconds. I And I've done that. It just takes five seconds to do a Google search to verify the fact. There are sites now who will do the uh, fact verification for you. But that char na ki kuch acha wala message so jaldi se forward karo. Who will take time in that five seconds verification? That again part is some responsibility. Now I'm like, uh, again, like you, you want the government to be doing something? To have a red card system ki kisi ne false uh, uh, WhatsApp forward kiya to uske upar teen penalties and you're out of WhatsApp. Probably we will have to come to that extent. Since people are not behaving responsibly in uh, consuming and in disseminating information. So finally, finally, it boils down to all of us as responsible citizens. Thank you. Yes, uh, we do agree with you. And uh, at this note, definitely the beauty of any session is when people from diverse background meet and exchange their knowledge. Today, having you in our session surely added a new perspective to the theme. With so much you talked and shared with us, uh, Dr. Rahul, we definitely had a, have a great food for thought. So at this note, I once again would like to thank you on behalf of the entire organizing committee of this training program. And um, 
to for further uh, uh, to move ahead i would now like to hand over this dais to dr shadab khan over to dr shadab khan uh thank you so much dr nitu malik for conducting these uh, two uh, speaker sessions uh the next resource person we have he is uh, from an idm brother we have two young professionals from an idm so we have mr harshit sharma a young pro professional from ecdrm nidm division mr harshit has a vast experience in the field of administration he has done his uh, graduation from kumayu university nainital uttarakhand and pursuing his masters in pubet from indira gandhi national open university uh, he has held various important administrative positions earlier in the nidm and has worked in the vigilance department of indian oil corporation limited he also holds a diploma in office management from young men's christians association new delhi i welcome mr harshit to present his paper on women's participation in disaster management thank you thank you very much adab sir uh, for the introduction and uh, first of am i audible sir yeah you are okay Okay, okay, okay. Enough, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. First, I I would like to uh, congratulate uh, both the teams from NIDM and from Aditi Mahavidyalay to conduct a training program on such an important topic, the role of the women, uh, women's participation, how it is important uh, uh, to refrain from the gender equality. Uh, basically, we can say. So our previous speaker, Dr. Rahul uh, sir, has also emphasized on various things uh, like uh, the role of media and how can we take the initiatives at our end. As we all know that the governments are taking various initiatives at their end. Uh, like globally, the we can uh, see the Paris Agreements and uh, Sendai framework, and at the national level, we can see the Prime Minister's Ten Point Agenda, which our uh, Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi uh, has adjusted the gather gathering. Uh, on the asian ministerial conference basically mcdrr in 2016 and agenda 3 he has raised that uh, regarding the leadership of the women women leadership so most of the points have already been covered so i will talk on the women's participation in the disaster management sector so i am sharing my presentation is it visible sir Hello. Yes. Uh, yes. And yes. Is, it, it it is, is it moving? Is it moving? Is it moving? Because this is not, the no, no, no. not yet. Not yet. But it is moving on my desktop actually. This is the introduction part and reasons. You can click on the slide one by one on your left hand side. Is this uh, right way? Yeah, yeah. The the very next slide. Yeah. Then this way this now it's moving. It's staying. It's staying. Yeah. Now you okay. Can. Okay. Okay. Shall I continue? Yeah. Okay. Please. So, uh, dear participants, uh, we will start the presentation with some introductory portion that how can the uh, in which manner our women. Uh, are being affected in our community uh, basically uh, due to the disasters natural disasters human made disasters not only at national level we can uh, say it uh, at the globally globally basically so uh, this is the introduction of the uh, ppt the disasters have had a great impact on the lives of women all around the world and women are looked as victims during disasters despite the fact that the majority of victims in disasters are women and children the study says and the role of women in facing the aftermath of disasters the outcome of disasters basically is totally neglected and especially in developing countries this has been noticed in the developing countries which are uh, the most vulnerable to the disasters and these countries has faced a number of disasters in the last decade Uh, which have killed thousands of precious lives and accounted for heavy economic losses infrastructural losses etc and it has been observed that more than half of the victims in the past disasters are women this uh, is the study not only at national level we can uh, uh, we can include it at globally and during major disasters women do not have technical knowledge about disaster occurrence in general and the participation of women in planning designing 
implementing and monitoring emergency programs and rehabilitation projects is still on a low key profile and develop in developed countries uh, developed countries have performed well in terms of gender based disaster management approach but still in times of disasters women are easily prone to be affected due to the disaster so what are the reasons so there are some reasons which have been noted a few commonly reasons are uh, recorded as the cultural constants we can uh, say the traditional practice in the basically it has been noticed in the rural areas we all can see in the rural areas this thing the cultural practice traditional practice that uh, we can uh, notice the lack of the participation of the women in disaster management not only in disaster management sector in various sectors uh, in multiple sectors we can say lack of skills such as swimming or tree climbing and less physical strength than males in part due to biological differences and but in some countries and also due to the effects of prolonged nutritional deficiencies caused by less access to food than men and boys next we can take some examples how the uh, women or girls are affected uh, due to the disasters across the country or globally so uh, in 1991 cyclones in bangladesh some uh, 90% of those who died were women and when cyclone nargis hit myanmar in 2006 so the death rate uh, among adult women was double uh, that of men and more women than men were killed by ebola because uh, they were the ones who washed and prepared the bodies of those who died from the disease for burial thereby exposing themselves in uh, to infection and also at the 2004 indian ocean tsunami women and children made up 77% of the victims in indonesia so these are some examples so next one is women's participation in disaster management what are the examples how can we say that in india women are participating in this sector so between 2013 and 2015 india experienced more than six major natural disasters across six states including floods landslides droughts cyclones so what are the results how can we include the women in this sector so more than 300 cyclone shelters have been built across 10 states and 2 to 6 cyclone shelters management and maintenance committees have been formed at the village level comprising both women and men and to provide search rescue and first aid support to each shelter 149 village level uh, task forces were formed from youth volunteers with about 50% participation of women in these groups and in andhra pradesh effective models of ownership have been formed with velugu women self groups that manage and maintain the planned to uh, to to uh, multi purpose cyclone shelters so these are few examples which we, uh, we have taken so what are the initiatives uh, what are the initiatives taken by the government uh, globally and nationally so uh, we can mention here the sendai framework sendai monitoring framework so the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction the 2030 agenda for two sustainable development and the paris agreement include the common objective of reaching gender equality basically it talks about the gender equality and specifically the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction 2015 2030 emphasizes that women and their participation are critical to effectively managing disaster risk and designing resourcing and implementing gender sensitivity disaster risk reduction policies plans and programs and adequate capacity building measures need to be taken to empower women for preparedness as uh, as well as uh, build uh, their capacity for alternate livelihood means in post disaster disaster situations alongside these international frameworks in 2016 the convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women has developed general recommendations on general uh, gender related uh, dimensions of disaster risk reduction drr in a changing climate and the general recommendations provide guidance to state parties to promote and protect human rights of women at all stages of disaster prevention preparedness response recovery and adaptation next one is the 2016 regional platforms for disaster risk reduction have reconfirmed gender equality and women's empowerment and leadership at the core of disaster risk reduction efforts to achieve the sendai framework targets and sustainable development goals by 
so what is the initiative uh, which have been taken by our government nationally so we can uh, which i have previously mentioned at the introductory portion that prime minister's uh, agenda uh, point uh, 10 point agenda which uh, have been initiated in uh, the asian ministerial conference uh, in disaster risk reduction in 2016 so in uh, agenda 3 agenda point 3 it uh, emphasizes on the women's leadership and uh, greater involvement should be central to disaster risk management so what is the explanation of this so it is necessary to encourage greater involvement and leadership of women in disaster risk management to support special needs of women affected by disasters and women are generally seen as vulnerable to disasters but women can play an important role in disaster risk reduction at the household society community and beyond we need large number of women volunteers engineers masons and building artisans uh, um, to participate in post disaster reconstructions and promote women self help groups which can assist in livelihood recovery and there is a need to include women in ndrf national disaster response forces and sdrf state disaster response forces and to train elected women representatives at the local level under development because the involvement of women girls at the local level is very very important because the local level people community uh, are the first responder uh, to any disaster and i would like to mention here that uh, at the national level uh, we, we, uh, before the previous year i think there is one exam uh, which is called national defense academy exam nda exam uh, which is uh, the 12th uh, which may be filled by the students uh, after 12th or pursuing 12th so the male candidate uh, before previous years the male candidates only can fill this form but our uh, government has initiated uh, a new steps um, over there and uh, from this year i think uh, in the national defense academy exam uh, the girls candidates can also apply in this exam and uh, can uh, ensure their leadership in the military indian military basically so this is the position of the lieutenant lieutenant uh, uh, position in indian uh, military so uh, this these are some steps which are being taken by our governments nationally and globally but we have to think what uh, kind of steps we are taking at the local level at our level uh, for our society so we have and i would like to conclude my presentation with one quote that empower women empower the human community and the base on which the word stands is a woman so we all have to think over it so thank you very much once again for inviting me and giving me this opportunity thanks over to you sir am audible ah yes you were quite audible thank you so much mr harshit for presenting your paper i'll give a very quick round for question and answer if there is any question if you want to ask students faculty members uh, thank you so much for the most interesting and inspiring workshop we didn't uh, we did not only enjoy it but have tried to practice it uh, this you. training program educated us with some concrete and authentic tools for our futuristic challenges we are highly obliged to have you with us mr harshit thank you very much sir we'll take some questions in a second round once ms fatma will complete her presentation okay. uh now we have a uh, another participant uh, another speaker uh, she is uh, uh, she is from uh, kashmir and she has done her graduation from kashmir university uh the name is miss fatima binte amin uh, she is also a young professional like harshit uh, fatima binte amin is presently working as a young professional in an idm and she has done her master from kashmir university as i told you and she has working on different papers and participated in national and international training webinar and conferences she is an experienced professional skilled in emergency management and public speaking cyber law and leadership so i welcome on behalf of a uh, whole uh, geography department at the mahavidyalaya and the organizing committee so please uh, present your paper and her title of her paper is sustainable development goals and gender equality 
So, uh, actually, uh, thank you so much for your welcome and thanks for giving me a, an opportunity to speak about uh, the SDG. Since I'm not going to share my uh, paper, it's actually I'm just going, going to share about the SDG and the gender equality for that. I'd just like to share my screen. Yeah, so uh, just let me know if my screen is visible. Yeah, you are visible. Okay. Uh, so then yeah, I'm just it's visible now. It's visible now. Yeah. So I guess all of you can see it. So I'm just going to speak about the SDG and uh, gender equality. Uh, just some time. So, uh, uh, eight minute. Uh, I'm just presenting for you guys. Please. Is it okay if I can uh, switch off my camera? Or have I to uh, like uh, keep my camera open? So, without wasting uh, much more time, as we all know, we are like, uh, there are uh, 25 years or. Uh, after the World Conference in Beijing uh, placed gender equality firmly on the global agenda, women continue to struggle to, re uh, to realize these girls' rights that uh, with a new report by the UN fired the climate conflict and alarming risk to the inclusion politics all threaten future progresses towards gender equality women are vulnerable to climate change because they are more likely to be poor not in that way in the poor we have the, the the actual definition of poor is they're more likely to die in climate fuel fuel disaster than men and more uh, likely to be displaced they grow much of the world's food but often on the most degraded land a climate change forces them to walk a few further together firewood and water, which takes them uh, time and can put them in danger. So we know that 49 countries lacks laws protecting women from either we can talk first about the domestic violence. There was a report uh, along uh, that, that shows the economic costs of the uh, climate crisis, uh, rise uh, displacement and forced migration, poverty and insecurity, uh, which have a uh, disproportionate impact on women and girls. Uh, including uh, through uh, like um, greater exposure to the ab uh, abuse and violence. These st uh, statistics show that all 39% uh, of women currently work in the agriculture, forestry, and fisheries sector. Just a 4% of agriculture landholders are women. Uh, men are 75% of uh, parliamentarians hold. 73% um, of uh, managerial positions and uh, our 70% of climate negotiations are almost about for the peacemakers, if you talk about. And uh, if specifically talking about the SDG, the uh, goal of SDG, the, if we talk about the uh, other goals, the goal five clearly indicates about the gender equality. In this goal, you will see that it's particularly driving to the empowered women and girls as well as to address the discrimination and unequal treatment they face in various societies. The uh, gender equality persists worldwide. And uh, as we see, there are a lot of deaths that are, that are, that are because of the violence. Although we are uh, progressing, but in that progress, uh, can we just say that the women are more affected or you can just give me example, like if, if uh, or uh, you can just give, cite some examples from your end where we are, although we are developing, uh, we are moving towards uh, towards development or what we can say uh, right now, we are develop in a developing condition. We are not developed yet. We don't, we, uh, India doesn't come, uh, come under the developed nations. We are developing, but uh, I don't think I'll, it will be wrong to say that women are uh, suffers a lot during this development. Women's equal access to agricultural resources could support uh, uh, like SDG2 that's on reducing hunger. So if we can treat women equally, that can help us in achieving that particular goal. Excuse it has been me, estimated that the tackling gender equality. Yeah. Your slides are not moving, ma'am. We would like to see them. Okay. The slide could show, you yeah. let me know on which slide uh, it's showing. Is this uh, first one only? Yeah, it's first uh, one only. You haven't yes. moved to the second one. 
Okay, uh, just a minute. I'll just like to stop my presentation. Just let me know then. Is it, uh, are you able to see this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, please let me know. Now you are on your third slide, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. So yeah, uh, is it is it necessary to make it yeah. full screen or I can keep it? No, it's okay only? if you're comfortable with it, but it should be visible. Yeah, yeah. So I was talking about the uh, goal five and how uh, SDG's uh, goal two is, will help us in uh, well, like attaining the gender equality. And it has been uh, estimated that uh, tackling gender equalities in uh, uh, if we can give the example that it could, uh, if you could increase the crop yield by 7.3% uh, and uh, or so boost some uh, national, uh, national that is for that you can uh, improve the boost the national, the, uh, the gross domestic, uh, domestic uh, GDP by 1.8%. Uh, so when women have secure and land tenure and they are more likely to adapt climate friendly practices. Even evidences are from that uh, the forest sectors reveals that women's participation in forest management enhance outcomes. So you can see that the, how women uh, in, like involvement is important for all of us. So coming to the next slide, it's like a uh, same talking about the implementation of SDG five. That is about the uh, gender equality. It's like you are empowering women and girls to achieve gender equality requirements and concerned efforts for all stakeholders, like uh, to include them in uh, different stakeholders, to include them in business. Women faces illegal questions. We can say that uh, sexual harassment and glass ceiling, sexism, discrimination because of pregnancy. Okay. The legal training, meaning negotiation are some of the like the in and in, in uh, this we can implement uh, gender equality. So these are some ta targets that are under the goal five. That is why we are talking specifically talking about gender equality. We have to see, we have to end all fo forms of discrimination against all women and girls everywhere. Eliminate all forms of violence against all women and girls in the public and private spheres, including trafficking and sexual and other types of exploitation. We have to eliminate all uh, harmful practices such as child or early and forced marriage and uh, female uh, genital uh, mutilation. That, that's usually uh, done in the far flanks. Although, although develop, uh, people are concerned about that thing and uh, recognize, recognize and value unpaid care and domestic violence. That was seen very, like there was a huge rise in domestic uh, uh, violence or, or we, we can say during uh, COVID-19, the, the uh, uh, police had the large number of cases of uh, domestic violence during uh, during COVID. So yeah, ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision making in political, economic, and public life. And if we are comparing gender equality with climate change, we can say that like come first. I will just continue the all, all targets like. Uh, I guess everyone is aware of all those targets. Still, I'll just mention all uh, some of them. That uh, the another target of SDG and uh, like uh, the goal five is to ensure the use of enabling technologies and particular information and communication technologies to promote empowerment of women. We have to adapt the strength in the sound policies and enforce legislations for the promotion of gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls at all levels. Uh, if talking about the synergies between the climate change uh, that I was talking about, the climate change and the gender inequality, and as a group most uh, affected by climate change, we may need to be heard. Okay, yet climate change are often gender blind. We can say that, or ignoring, or even uh, exaggerating existing inequalities. Um, there was some research that was a uh, uh, it was done in Vietnam that and that research showed that women waves are rarely like, uh, aims to reduce emissions from uh, deforestations and forest degradations, which are more likely therefore to reflect male priorities. And um, if they, you, you just have a look at this uh, the slide and you can say that you can see the different like only 65.46 of the women are lit literate compared to the 82% of, of 
uh, 82.14% of men. Okay. The enrollment primary education is 100%, but women are not enrolled in higher education. So you can see the gaps. Okay. The child sex ratio is 9.9. .9 and we, as that compared of the boys, although we are lucky that, uh, yeah, that we are, we had different scheme, schemes in that where uh, you can't uh, just, um, the, uh, you can't, you can't do this on a king of the, like, uh, to know the, uh, gender of uh, children is prohibited and those, those are the things that are done and in in one and three women have experienced some forms of physical or uh, that, that i mentioned uh, earlier and uh, it is not just uh, like achieving uh, gender equality and, and empowering of all women and uh, girls is a difficult task to do although there has been it's not like we, the uh, government or others are not doing anything although a lot of development has been done but still we just need equality that's it and coming to the next slide that is uh, these are some uh, figure facts and figures that in one in five women and girls aged between that is a uh, age gap having 14 to 49 reported experienced physical uh, violence that's just keep that and 47 percent of women uh, there are like homicide victims worldwide internationally like intentionally killed by by the partner or family member uh, or some issues on them and 49 countries have no, as I mentioned in the first slide, that 49 countries have no law, law specifically protecting women from dom domestic violence. They are like, okay, if man is beating uh, or uh, if a husband is beating uh, his uh, his wife, that is totally okay and that is acceptable. He can do anything for uh, to her. But no, that this there is nothing like that. There are laws that, that you can't do, and like this is not the way. Uh, like you should you should know uh, what what are actually rights and how, how how on the earth you are treating your wife in such a way and 37 countries exempt rape uh, preparations from uh, precautions if they are married to some subsequently marry uh, the victim okay and uh, <coughs> at least 20 million women and girls have undergone fgem okay so a child marriage were 75 billion women and girls alive to were married before their 80th, 80th birthday. Uh, but so you can see that has there been any process or uh, uh, is the trend decre increasing or decreasing? See, there were two figures on the right side there in 2015, there were only 19 to 8% married uh, or, uh, or um, in 2000, you can see 22%. So yeah, the trend is decreasing, but in some, um, like in, 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 there is there is there is not too much difference between 2000 and 2015 15 years is not as like a huge 15 years of uh, uh, after uh, like uh, between if comparison between two, uh, these two so you see there is for improve uh, coming to the next that is women do three times as much unpaid care and domestic work. Nobody cares where she has eaten something uh, or uh, are you feeling all right? Some other things, no one cares. If you, Unless and until you don't have food on your table, you will not ask a question. If there is no food on your table, you will start asking the question. Is everything all right? Why is not? And you know, but are you okay or not? It will be like, uh why is where is where is my food where is why don't have placed my food well, i don't know any reason or, or some there are some people there who doesn't even care and they will start start uh, like um, uh, using uh, abusing them at that they were very fixed um, uh, that particular moment and they didn't even care about the children since the way speaks like the action you are doing it will have a direct impact on your children okay you are just uh, abusing your wife in front of uh, your children what do you what will be the action or what will be the reaction to that particular thing your children will be that okay my father even i i, I don't i don't have time to show to show you that particular video in which the there were some uh, one boy and a girl they were playing some uh, they were doing some i don't know there was a short, a short move, uh, video was that in which uh, there were uh, like um, uh, a father mother and some friends came over and the daughter of that particular uh, father say like he started ab abusing her. Okay, we will get married. After that, you will stop. Uh, like you will start uh, beating me. And the uh, girl uh, that like th those girl child. And she said yes. As uh, as my papa uh, after coming from office, she he started beating beating uh, my mom. So I will be okay for that. 
and there is some yeah some because all of our using so much of social media there some movies before that th- thappard that also came and, and that 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 thing also showed about the domestic violence and, and how we, either we think about so log kya kahenge society kya kahenge if we think about that particular thing log aur society kya kahenge i guess our condition will be worse we just have to to uh, like to, to raise again is all this all the violence that we are having and uh, uh india's like uh, what uh, uh, goal five and um, role of india is like although india has achieved gender partiality at the primary education level and it's on the track to achieve uh, partiality at all at all education levels as of, as we talk about the june uh, 2019 the proportion of seats in lok sabha held by women has only reached 11 percent but uh, 46 in the panchayati raj institutions so india is also confronting the challenge of violence against women as example a baseline study revealed that in new delhi 92% of women had experienced some forms of uh, sexual violence in public space during their lifetime in 2016 close to the third of total crimes reported against women in india were cruelly uh, cruelty of physical violence by their husband or their uh, or his or her relatives the government of india has identified ending violence against women as a key national priority which uh, resonates with the sustainable development target of united nations on gender equality the uh, prime minister's beti bachao beti uh, padhao initiative aims at uh, equal opportunities and education for girls in india in addition specific interventions on female employment programs on uh, the empowerment of adolescent girls the skanya samriddhi yojana on girl child prosperity and the janani uh, suraksha yojana for mothers ad- advance india government together to gender equality and uh, and uh, the target of goal 4 uh, so um, this was all from my end uh, i'm just concluding my uh, topic here thank you so much Uh, thank you so much, Fatima Binte Amin, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, before I sum up your paper, uh, I would like open the desk for question and answer. If any of our student want to ask any question, they are most welcome. so thank you so much uh, uh, ms fatima uh, so much for your presentation you. was you. just when we needed to boost our innovative ideas and mindset and working practices we just wanted to let you know how much we appreciated your structured approach to such a wide topic with some fantastic takeaways which i can put into practice thank you once again uh, let me sum up your papers you have very beautifully presented sdgs and as compared to the uh, gender equality the topic which you have raised that was a very burning uh, topic like Uh, you have talked about women's and and their share uh, and their involvement not only in india but the developed countries also uh, you also speak a lot about the goal 5 and talked about the empowering women uh, implementing sdgs of course india is implementing sdgs earlier uh, before we have uh, millennium development goals mdgs and we have done very well in mdgs also and we have to complete this task by 2030 uh the things which you have emphasis on is equality gender and in indian terms you talk about the violence particularly the domestic violence so this is the issue which people generally do don't raise i mean it's a they are every state story and uh, as far as uh, uh, your fgms is concerned uh, very openly you have talked about that issue also you no know, we know in india child marriage is a very big issue we are working on that also and lastly you have spoken about the sexual violence also which is which is also i mean a particular one section of the female is so much vulnerable so thank you so much for enlightening us with your views uh, as far as uh, mr harshit sharma's uh, uh, presentation was concerned uh, he has given a bit broader picture about particularly on the asian region he talked about bangladesh he talked about india he talked about the nargis uh, the cyclones he also mentioned the exact figures the 70% of women were affected during that time uh, he talked about 
quota i mean uh, in uh, in uh, in bangladesh in 1991 90% were women were affected that's a quite a big large pictures i mean somewhere it shows how vulnerable women are when disaster occur and then we have a nargis he told about the 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 female casualties were double as compared to the men uh, he also talked about the tsunamis which has happened in 2004 in indonesia there we have a 70% casualties uh, under which we have most of the fem- uh, female or you can say the women and child were affected he given example of uh, velugu women of andhra pradesh so uh, he also talked about the sandai framework in sdgs framework he also talked about the paris agreement so he tried to cover up all the topics in a nutshell within a 15 minutes of his presentation so uh, i wish both of you young professional for your future and reviews good luck to both of you thank you so much sir thank you now it's time we are heading towards our validity uh, session uh, before that uh, i would like to mention that due to some emergency um, sir uh, this anil kumar gupta sir from anadem he is not been able to attend this validity section uh, session so i request uh, our uh, tic professor punyata patra ma'am to give our concluding remarks over to you ma'am i am muted am i audible now am i audible now yes yes ma'am yes, you are ma'am audible. you are audible yeah yeah uh, so thank you dr shada shada so um, uh, professor anil kumar gupta and professor mamta Sh- sharma from our side and professor Mam- anil kumar gupta from nidm side they are quite busy so uh, they could not come to for this validity program anyway uh, so uh, just a minute ma'am before you start let me interrupt you Sorry? let me interrupt you just for a two minutes so uh, before ma'am start let me introduce ma'am's introduction as you all know she is our dear punya tara patra ma'am there's a little small introduction about ma'am uh, she has done her phd uh, from delhi school of economics in the year of 2005 ma'am has authored four books and many research papers in journals of national and international repute and chapters in edited books professor punya tara patra has received major awards sponsored by the university grant commission from 2007 to 10 she has rich experience of being a consultant with premier organizations such as ongc atomic mineral division government of india crisis risk and infrastructure solution private limited and so on she has been honored as the associate professor at indian institute of advanced study shimla from 2006 to 2008 for her notable interest in forest and land development and management she has been conferred with the best lecture award by the government of delhi in 2011 for her not worthy involvement in teaching she has also been the recipient of national and international funding to visit many countries to present her research time to time we are so happy to be here ma'am please thank you thank you so much dr shada for your kind words kind introduction so uh, my dear all the dignitaries and students from across the country very very good afternoon to one and all it's really a great experience while organizing this three day training program with national institute of disaster management since the very first day of our collaboration the guidance of dr kopal verma from nidm helped us to adhar to nidm guidelines in all three days we had resource persons from across the country from across the discipline and also from across all age groups which is very 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 essential for this disaster management disaster risk reduction uh, as professor sharma has already mentioned and on the first day basics of gender gender and disaster were discussed 
from three different perspectives geographical economic and from the perspective of social work professional and on the second day legal framework and policies issues of asia and africa in general and india in particular was discussed and on the third day in that continuation the participants got to know about the disaster risk reduction from the resource persons who were working with community who are working with community and who work in disaster prone areas also and our students are very much motivated by the presentation of young professionals from nidm i am sure the participants must have great learning experience and here um i want to mention that our department i mean the faculty of our department then not only teach disaster management to our geography honor students they also teach the students from other discipline who have opted for generic elective uh, uh, paper for disaster management so we look forward to collaborate with nidm in many other projects in future so this training program this is not the end this is the beginning this is the beginning and with these words i remain thank you very much thank you very much for your cooperation in various roles thank you very much to all the participants all the resource persons all the officials academicians from nidm and everyone from our institution all my colleagues thank you very much over to shada uh Good thank you so much uh, thank you so much punya to ya ma'am for these kind words and summing up very beautifully of all these three days online training program and now it's uh, time to do a vote of thanks and let me start by speech of vote of thanks so i'll start with a very good or graceful evening to all of you let me first of all start by giving glory to the almighty god for making three days online program a resounding success thank you is just not a word it is more than an emotion it's my great honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this memorable online program an online program like this cannot happen overnight the wheels started rolling weeks ago and it requires planning and a bird's eye view for detail we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a very proactive and dedicated team i am short of word for their involvement and their willingness to take on the completion of task beyond their comfort zones i would also like to express our sincere thanks to honorable principal of our college and convener of this program professor mamta sharma ma'am we all are inspired by your great words we are also grateful to nidm and professor anil kumar gupta for his kindness interest and encouragement in these three days all the speakers have beautifully added to the glory of this online program i also want to extend thanks to all the speakers who have enlightened our minds with their important and worthy opinions on disasters your thoughts on gender planning and policy making have shown us a new directions this will surely encourage us in all our future endeavors i sincerely thank all the technical members for glorifying this program from day 1 to day 3 dr roshni devi ms sne gangwar along with shishti mehta harshita sakshi nandini kritika ratawal to operate zoom platform i also thank coordinator of day 1 program dr nitu malik and dr shital sharma along with dr roshni devi as organizing secretary coordinator of day 2 program dr mamta arora along with dr anju singh as a organizing secretary coordinator of day 3 program today's program again dr neetu malik ji and myself dr shadab khan as an organizing secretary too i thank to my fellow colleagues ms shikha yadav and dr jagmohan for their suggestions but there is a person who right from the beginning coordinate this 3 day online program dr kopal verma saini junior consultant from nidm i thank for her timely help and cooperation whenever we needed now now it's time to share the names of our shining stars of 
धरित्री जोग्राफिकल डिपार्टमेंट और धरित्री सोसाइटी प्रेजिडेंट मिस स्वाति सेक्रेटरी मिस सृष्टि मेहता ज्वाइंट सेक्रेटरी सुचाना मैती एंड ट्रेजर दीक्षा दास इन टेक्निकल कमेटी वी हैव हर्षिता साक्षी झजोरिया एंड सृष्टि मेहता सोशल मीडिया हैंडल बाय हर्षिता नंदनी सृष्टि मेहता साक्षी कृतिका रातावल एंड आम्रपाली वी हैव ए ग्रुप लीडर्स डिवाइडेड डे वाइज सो डे वन प्रोग्राम वी हैव स्वाति एंड श्रेया डे टू वी हैव स्वालिया एंड विद्या एंड डे थ्री प्रोग्राम वी हैव ए ग्रुप लीडर्स महक स्वीटी एंड सृष्टि वॉलेंटियर्स हु वर्क द लेटर पार्ट ऑफ द नाइट स्वाति सृष्टि महक एंड स्वीटी फॉर देयर अनटायरिंग एफर्ट्स वी हैव ए पीपीटी टीम विच मेड वेलकम एंड थैंक्स लाइट्स ऑफ रिसोर्स पर्सन वी हैव स्वाति विद्या इशिका श्रेया महक स्वीटी स्वालिया आदिति भारती सृष्टि दीप्ति चौधरी एंड सिमरन फ्लाई टीम इंक्लूड्स द नेम ऑफ मोनू लकी इशिका एंड भूमिका अत्री फिलर्स मेड बाय सृष्टि मेहता वी हैव ए डॉक्यूमेंट्री ऑल्सो विच वॉज मेड बाय स्वीटी निकिता प्रीति कुमारी आम्रपाली नीला खोनो मेरे ऋषिता गौतम एंड अदिति पॉल गुप्ता नेशनल एंथम टीम इंक्लूड्स द नेम ऑफ मेहा दीप्ति निधि एंड नंदनी फॉर सरस्वती वंदना आई थैंक रितिका अलॉन्ग विद मेहा दीप्ति निधि स्वाति एज अ टीम मेंबर एंड राइटिंग पार्ट कवर्ड बाय कृतिका रातावल वी हैव अदर वॉलेंटियर्स वो हैव डम्स एंड अटेंडेंस वी हैव चारू अरोड़ा दीक्षी दास सिमरन सहरावत एंड सिमरन दरोलिया I also thank Budding Rock starts from our college right from BA honors BA program BA pass course and BA led students all of you remember your days of hard work were evident in your act so i also thank to our geography fraternity across delhi university family i am grateful to mr yashveer kumar for guiding us all the support for conduct this online program and of course i owe a special gratitude to convener of this online program and rtic of geography department professor punya praya patra for her interest and continued support to make this online program a reality before i end i must say that the audience has been exceptional because without a disciplined and extremely engaged audience an online training program cannot be successful and what i appreciated the most was the most of resource person joined before on time which enable us in time management i am gratified to all the audience for coming here and for their best wishes for this program we thank you for being with, being with us and it has remained a pronounced pleasure all is well that ends well finally i leave you the inspiring quote by henry ford coming together is a beginning keeping together is progress and working together is success once again thank you all for presence and attention a big thank you all to all jai hind jai bharat uh now i request uh, everyone to please stand up in honor of our national anthem and after national anthem we will have a group picture uh thank you so much uh, dr roshni can we have a group picture yes sure i request all participants to to just switch on their cameras please
Uh, technical team, I request to take the cl clicks. Yes, ma'am. I hope it's done. Harshita? Yes, ma'am. One moment. Thank you all for this Kodak movement. Over to you, Shadab ji. On uh, behalf of Dharitri Society, on behalf of all of Geography Department, I thank you all, all colleagues, all colleagues from Geography Department, from Delhi University, and uh, my dear students, thank you so much for making this program a great success. Thank you all.